Welcome to the second annual Fatherhood Unity Month, where we get the fatherhood story and bring solutions to families. And uh, today is a special day. Um, man, you guys don't know how excited I am to be talking to Dr. David J. Pate. Um, and, and Dr. Pate, you know, we, we blasted out the flyer and, you know, hopefully people went and took a look at but welcome thank you thank you so much for inviting me this is a pleasure oh yeah but it's home uh, yes it's yes. Home, right it's it's a, it's another home for you and um it's another opportunity for people to get to know uh what it looks like uh healthy fatherhood looks like and what fathers are doing like just to work um you know, from your work. And again, if they didn't read the bio, that's their loss for us. It's really getting the information and, and that's where I want to start. So how was your day? My day was good, really busy. I uh, talked to a lot of students today and uh, trying to write a book chapter that's way overdue and trying to get some new money for new research. So it's a typical busy day, and uh, but it was good. Okay, so all we're going to get is the fatherhood story. Uh, how important fathers is, you know, to the community and right the uh, fatherhood solution. So, uh, with that being said, um, just give the people a little bit about David Pate, right? Because sure, they, sure. They don't know. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, I'm a graduate of University of Detroit. A big, a proud grad. I'm a proud Titan. Um, from Philly, though, originally from Philly, then recruited to University of Detroit. Um, have really good friends in Detroit. I've known now for over 40 years. Uh, so I have very good ties to Detroit in terms of my uh, paternal relationship there, but also my friends who are there from when I was a student. Um, I am someone who has been studying fathers now for since 1982. Um, that's been my area of work there where I looked at just what, how men contribute to their children's lives. Um, what are some of the barriers or challenges that are presented to black men in particular? Um, what black, how black men view their role as a father and the occupation of fatherhood. Um, and so I'm, I'm now a professor at University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, um, where I'm the chair of the department for social work and I'm also an associate professor there, but I'm also an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison at the Institute for Research on Poverty um, where, which serves as a research base for me as well. Um, I have two children um, who are one in their 30s and one in their late 20s. And I've been with my wife now for going on 36 years, which is hard for me to believe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that's who I am. I believe that, I believe in my work that Black men are very dedicated to their kids, no matter what their income is. Um, some that some make, most, most of them make, the best choice they can make so that their child is okay. Um, but unfortunately, some of them have been met with some challenges that makes their life very hard. So I try to document that and tell that story to, many, to as many people as I possibly can. Exactly, and, and, and that brings us to the conversation. So I know that brings us to the conversation because I know when we were on the all were on the call, I couldn't help but fire off questions, right? And it got to the yeah. point. <laughs> It got to the point. Well, and, and it's because I'm I'm kind of passionate and driven about it because I come from um, not having the in-house dad experience. Okay. You know, and so uh, once I saw uh, my value and saw fatherhood for what it was worth, I really began to dive a little deeper. But if you can touch on that very thing, in your in your thirty some years or almost forty years of research. Mm -hmm. uh, about um, black fathers and fatherhood period, what what are the the the, the signs that uh, makes a father go away from his kids if they're in? It? You know, there's there's a there's a lot of um, things that can unfortunately challenge a father to be actively engaged in his child's life. So, some of his policy, um, some of the policies that are currently in place don't allow for fathers to be in the household. And so the father and mother may decide jointly 
or he may decide is best for her because they both are low income. They don't have a whole lot of resources. So that makes it harder for her for her to receive the benefit because um, people people don't they just some states just don't allow it, even though I, I'm someone who studies policy. Um, and so fathers can be in the same household. It depends on the state and the mother could still get the benefit, but it depends on the state and how they set the income levels. But the other reason is that sometimes relationships are just not good. Um, I think we all have had our share of good and bad relationships. And sometimes they start out really, not most times they start out really well. Um, and then they don't stay in the space where you want them to stay. And then once you have a child, the one thing that I've noticed over time is that we don't recognize black men as fathers. We don't recognize black men as parents. And some of that is due to the issues that have been the foundation of, of what has been laid as that's mama's baby, daddy's maybe. You know, I, know you, I know you guys have heard that song or that theme. And the truth is, yeah, we do know it's mommy's baby because the baby comes out of her and you can see it, but we don't know who the father is, even though people know. Um, so it, it's, it's a really complicated, complex answer to it, but it varies from person to person. Now, the truth be known, the only study that's been done as recent as 2012 was a study from the federal government that proved the most involved fathers, no matter what their income level, is Black men. Because Black men will serve as the babysitter, not, not for lack of a better word, they're the child care provider. If the mother's working, they will also serve as the provider when they have the money to be the provider. They will also serve as the school teacher, the, the, they'll braid the hair. The black fathers do much more parenting than white fathers do, or Latino fathers, or Native American. Black fathers are the most involved fathers, even though the media and others will not acknowledge the, the truth about the role of fathers. Now, true that people, somebody might say, well, my daddy's never been around. That may be true. But that's not all Black fathers. And we can't just say all Black men are not good fathers. All Black men are this. Nobody's all anything. You know, you have to look at each individual for what they present to their family and why they can present. But one of the biggest, the, one of the biggest issues I have with the men is that they often feel they can't be that breadwinner. They can't be the main provider. And that they think that's the reason why they shouldn't be allowed or involved with their children. Um, and, but that's a role that many men have a problem with. If they can't be that main provider or the one providing the majority of the income in the household, they feel they've shucked or not really attended to their role as a father. And so that's a real issue as well. And I think the one thing I've been trying to do in my work is trying to redefine what blacks, what is black masculinity, but also what is black fatherhood? Because it's different because of the histories of oppression and discrimination and lack of access, um, and also just feelings of identity. And I think people are brought into the fact and, and drank the Kool-Aid and believe that Black men are not engaged. And I know in my research, that's just not true. Um, I've talked to men from drug dealers to corporate fathers. They, they're, they're involved as, as much as they can be involved. So I don't, I don't, buy, the, I don't buy the story that I hear all the time. Right, I mean, because let's, let's face it, Health becomes an issue, so the father may have passed. Yes. Uh, drug use may become an issue. The father may have overdosed. Yes. Uh, and in and, 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 and our research, I discovered men don't just necessarily walk away from their kids. No, they it don't. Become, it becomes the time factor. Yes, yes. Where, where yes. I do not have access. And that's a big uh, phenomenon where I don't have access. And, and, and when we were in the policy group, we were talking about, Every other weekend is not quality time for a dad. No, no. Not, and his value is so high. So I, I man, that's that's important to note, right? Because I, we see this constantly played out, as as well as in, you know, you talk about providing. So I uh, later on I'll be in a conversation about fatherhood, and you know, I always cite providing means time. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Nurturing. Yes. Um, uh, a hug. Yes. Walks, right? Wisdom. Yes. We we place a high value on the pro, the provision around money, and that does create, to me, an unhealthy masculinity. It does exactly. I totally agree with you, and I, you know, and and 
it, that's an issue. I mean, one of the un, unfortunately, one of the highest unemployment rates is amongst black men, not because they don't want to work. Right. It's just that the opportunities for the types of jobs they can do based on education or based on skill level when based on opportunities is just not there. And unfortunately for black men, the, the social network for jobs is not the same for white and Latino men for whatever reason. And for my reason is racism, but that's, my, that's, that's a whole nother conversation, but we just don't provide the same, we don't have the same social network that other people have that allows them because there's such a strong distrust of black men. There's such a strong, in my opinion, hatred of black men for the bigger society. Um, even though they love us as sports figures, they love us for their entertainment, but they won't acknowledge our humanity or our citizenship, which we deserve because this country was built on the backs of black people, period. I mean, there's too much research and documented research that shows if black people who didn't come here as enslaved people, there wouldn't be an America. That's, and, and unfortunately, the threat of black masculinity is a real thing for America, period. Well, they have to get used to it, right? And, and it, it's time because we're, we're in a place in a time where we figured out uh, the, the 69 No Fault Divorce Act by yeah. Ken Ronald Reagan. We figured these things out. And we're now, like you say, the most involved father. But now we have, we've taken fatherhood to another level. And I don't think that we value that because, you know, uh, here's a scenario back in the 50s, it was the other way around. The men mm -hmm. were breadwinners. Mm -hmm. Men were the highest educated. Mm -hmm. The men were the leading household. And we took in uneducated women. We took in women who, right? And mm -hmm. we provided. Right now, I don't know if you know about this, but there is a 25-year stay-at-home dad event every year. They have oh, a no. stay-at-home, yeah, they have a stay-at-home dad convention, right? Okay. Right, and that's answering the dynamic for many other people, but it's very hard for us to accept that dynamic. Yes. Right? And just think about this. I, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with a guy that's been a stay-at-home dad for 20, 20 years. His impact on the household is beyond phenomenal. Okay. So, so his kids, right, the discipline that his kids have and exude shows up in the classroom, shows up mm -hmm. in the community, right, in a whole nother way. And yes. in, 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 in the stay-at-home dad convention, many men are working from home just to provide for their kids. And we have to shift to that mindset because women are out here educated and doing a thing. And because of that, what's, ex what's at stake is when that man moves, he leaves that boy, right? Mm -hmm. With less than what he deserves. And it becomes very, mm -hmm. very hard to shape a young man. So uh, great, great point. Um, in your research, you know, what did you see also, and you know the value of fathers. Like, what have you seen across the board when it comes to the value of fathers? You know, one one thing I did, and I'll, this is kind of, this, I hope this gets to the answer to your your question. One of the research, one time we interviewed women, and to and women who had been victims of domestic violence, for example, and they were very interested in the men being involved in the children's lives because they felt the men provided something they couldn't provide as a mother but also they cared about this father because they felt the fathers often were um, stressed out and feeling um, just neglected in other ways, but they still cared that his well-being was better off. And that's something that I, is very different for, for a white versus black woman. Black women in this area in particular were really interested in making sure their children had the value, had the benefit of both parents and not necessarily in the same household, but just that the both parents provide something different. One parent provides something different that's based on just who we are, if it's discipline or nurturing, because some it depends, you know, it just depends on the relationship. Many of these fathers I've learned could be more nurturing than the mother, just because of just who they are. And they're the ones who will be more, the one who would listen to the child. And it just really varied. Also, the one thing that is just a given is the discipline side of it. You know, there's a discipline that the father offers and a, a skill about survival that's very different than a mother can provide. Black men have to deal with survival in a different way just because of how they're viewed. 
And you know, I, I don't know if you have any boys, but I know that talk you give to your son and to your daughter, but more, more likely to your son, when you get stopped by the police, this is what you do. When you're going to this place, this is how you walk. When you are dating someone, this is how you should act. And those all are very important in, in, in how we want people to be perceived, but also to how you wanna be behaving in, in your outside appearance of being a black male or being a young black woman. How do you date somebody? That's another thing that that's, we often talk about men and son, fathers and sons, but for fathers and daughters, is also who, do, who are you gonna be dating and who would, and also I can give you a little bit of lowdown on the game that you might get talked to about. <laughs> that's important too for your daughters to know. So they don't get the, the game played on them. So I think that is, it, that's the, in my own research is the, the, the thing that I have found and I studied child support. That's the main thing I've studied for a while. For men whose children have been engaged in the welfare system of a given state, that child support system can really destroy whatever relationship the mother and father and children have, particularly if he's someone who's very low income or his salary is somewhat not steady. And that's a part of work that I try to do to, to try to get the state to see how they also contribute to harm for children and, and parents. Man, yeah, we, we, we're gonna come back to that because I, I really want to get in it, but I, I would love to hear your father's story. What was your father in your life? And what was that like? Um, my, well, my father died when I was three. So I, my, my biological father was not in my life. Um, unfortunately, I had a really very involved godfather uh, who took me fishing, um, who was very much like a father to me. So I was very, and, and they had no, my godparents had no children. So I was pretty much their child as in addition to my mother. My mother remarried and I had a stepfather who was not the best person. He, he tried, but he came from a house. He, he came from a home that was not very good. So he often took that out on us, to be honest. And so I was someone who he did, he did what he was supposed to do. He paid the bills. And he did um, the things that you traditionally think fathers would do, but he was not a loving person because he had his own issues. And I think that's a reality too, that we often have to, and I've forgiven him for that for many reasons, because you have to, to, you have to accept people where they are and not carry that with you. And I think that's a problem that we have people, they carry some of that with them and they don't let it go because if you don't let it go, you'll never develop yourself. Um, but I, but my stepfather was someone who taught me how to fish and how to cook and how to do all the kind of things that boys do. Um, and my stepfather taught me how to ride a bike and play basketball and those things too. But he was just, it was just two different versions of men who were involved. But my step, my godfather was the one who was more nurturing and this more, a more loving person who I really miss a lot. He was just a nice, really nice person. And I really enjoyed my time with him. So I always said to myself, I want to model my own behavior after my godfather, because he was just that he was a provider, but he was very nurturing. He was a cook. He did, he spent time with his children. Um, his children, one was me, then they, they adopted a daughter later. And they just really cared. And you can, and you can just, and he didn't have a whole lot of money, but you could just feel the care, the love and care that he gave. Um, so in my own household, I, I was raised with two parents, but I also had a godfather and I had uncles who were very engaged in my life as well. So I, I was very fortunate to have a variety of different, I could see a variety of all kinds of men, good and bad sides of them. But they all, they all the basics was they all loved, they, they all loved me. And I could tell, um, even, in their, even in their ways that may not have been the clearest. I, could, I know that was one of the things that I, I carry with me today. So, so of, of all the men that surround you, because I, I too had, a lot of men, um, one of which, uh, Sonny Man, uh, Mr. just passed away, right? Sonny Man was 84. And, oh, uh, and Sonny, Sonny Man lived right across the street. And what an example uh, of men th that you have around you, like you said. And my uncle gave me my first pair of Chuck Taylors. We ended up coaching together. Okay. And, um, you know, just the different examples of what a family looks like like and where i come from yes. family is really huge he just out of my grandparents my mother's parents house over 216 bodies came out of the house and the house is still in the family wow very nice yes yes and so we're, nice. 
we we are somewhat uh fractured but uh our love language is jokes right and it's, yes, it's yes. 10 of us right and so but i want to i want to touch on what is the one thing what is the one who gave you the biggest lesson the, you know, to be honest, my stepfather, even though it was not the best relationship, gave me the biggest lesson on what not to do, <laughs> to be honest. He gave me the biggest lesson on, you know, how you should treat, how you should treat a woman. Uh, he was also, also he taught me how to present myself in an in a, in a adult way. That part I will always be grateful for. How to dress, how to, how a man is supposed to act in ways when he's out in public. Um, he was, he, he was, um, he was an army navy. He was an air force person. So one, I had I had lots of chores. I had to shine my shoes because I went to a, I went to a private school. So I had to make sure my shoe. I learned how to shine shoes, which people don't know how to do nowadays. Um, and my wife is always surprised I can shine how well I shine a shoe. But I remember shining the shoe. It was like spit shine. I can make a bed like with the four corners. You know. So how how to take care of myself is what I learned from my stepfather and my godfather. That was something that was really a very valuable skill because I know so many men don't know how to take, how to take care of themselves. And that was something that I really learned early in my life. And it, it was a good take. And also to be independent. Um, I was someone who at 18 left home and I never went back. I mean, I would go visit, but I decided at 18 that I was gonna be on my own. And I thought that was, the, I think that was the best. And that was something that my stepfather encouraged us to do. And I'm grateful to that because it, it really forced me to make some adult decisions early because I think the whole idea of being independent is an important thing for all men. It's, all, it's, it's an important thing for all adults. But I think for men, it's just something that you have to learn to be. You have to learn to be independent. Um, and I, I, really, I really have valued that. Yeah, it, it was like that for me. 18, I left, went off to college and... Um... I, I just wish I had your stepfather, <laughs> right? right because, <laughs> because there was some things that, you know, you have to learn. Like you said, you get out here uh, at 18 and some of the decisions, um, thank God for my education because my high school education yeah. really prepared me. At that time, you're talking, you're coming out of Fern, I'm coming out of Ferndale High School, but we were up, put up on educationally uh, on everything that involved life. Right. So when I walked out of high yes, school, yes. I was thoroughly prepared for whatever. So I knew how to go to the banks. I knew how to right. They literally my education yeah, yeah. prepared me for for life. And so uh, yeah. once I got kicked out of college, I slid over to uh, I slid over to uh, uh, did a special Olympics. And next thing you know, I'm 20 years old. Uh, OK, I never look back. I've just been involved with. Uh, youth and men and work and coaching and my entire except you know for 36 years but I, I I'd like to touch on the 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 area that you know we were starting to, to go in um, you know and thank God for the, the stepfather but I'd like to step on step into that child support lane right and and really if yeah. you can um, if there are some things that you can share that many men don't one because i'm always telling men don't take poor advice from the street right you really want to put yourself because you're in this situation put yourself here you don't want to not you know so if you can mm -hmm. share things that you know we can most definitely highlight whatever it is that you can uh, share with us yeah it's important i mean the one thing one my very first project on child support was just asking men, what did they even understand about child support? And they often say, you know, that woman put me on child support. Many men don't understand that if a woman gets any kind of welfare cash benefit, um, if she gets any cash benefit from a state, she must name a father. She has no choice. If she doesn't do that, there's a possibility in the state she's in that she would not get any benefit so that would hurt. So unfortunately, that would hurt your children, but also it would hurt her. And so she has to name a father. She has to name some identifying information to get the benefit. And many men think that she did it because she's mad at him. Now, I'm not going to deny there are some women, there are people who do that. That's for sure. But and they do it to get back at him because she's mad at him because he's a new girlfriend or they're not together anymore. 
But also the state has a significant role in that they cause this confusion where it's, she's the one that can be blamed for it, but the state wants to get reimbursed uh, at least a portion of the money they've given to this mother for benefits. So it, it causes a lot of conflict. And, 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 and I often call that conflict state violence and that the state is causing violence against families who don't understand how the system works. And what I tell fathers and what, what I tell fathers often is that if you have a child support order, pay $5, pay something every month. It doesn't matter how much you pay, but pay them something because you, they, then they cannot say you didn't, you didn't try to pay down your debt um, that you may owe, or you didn't try. And you can always say, I couldn't do this, but I could at least give them $5 or whatever it is. Because that in Wisconsin, for example, if you don't pay your child support after 120 days, there's a warrant for your arrest that goes out so you can be put in jail. And you can stay in jail for up to 90 days or maybe even 120 days. It depends on, it depends on the county in Wisconsin. Um, and every state has the option to use that type of, of a penalty or a sanction. Um, but Wisconsin is one of the states that's much more aggressive than that. So I'd say to men that, that if, you, if there is a debt that you owe, that you should pay on it, particularly child support, because child support has some, um, and also if there's a caseworker at the child support office you can talk to, that you should, even though I know it can be not the friendliest space or, on, or it could be an uncomfortable space, that could be an end. Men should also understand that they can garnish your checks much easier than even the IRS. They're just very aggressive because the state wants their money back. Now, for people who have child support orders who are not part of the state, that's a whole different conversation. That's not what I study. I study poor men who make less than 20,000 a year and the mother of their children gets a benefit from the state. That's who I study and that's what I know the best. And those men I talked to, I haven't met one man yet. Maybe I, maybe, maybe I met two men out of this 900 or 1,000 men I've interviewed who, didn't, who weren't involved with their children. They're, these men are involved with, the, as much as they can be involved, most men I've talked to, I don't care what level of income they have, even if it's zero income, their kids know who their dad is. Um, it's just like might be this might be the friction of the relationship that doesn't allow them to keep that relationship. That's a that's the that's the tough thing. That's the piece that uh, made me start the father's own, right? Yeah. That's the 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 process. Why can't we see the importance of not destroying the kid? Yes. Through this animosity, right? Through this process. Um, uh, I was asked a question uh, last night. It was, it was a question. Um, what I think it's like 41 million children mm -hmm. in the child support system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so I was asked this question last night and it really, for me, uh, Dr. Pate, for me, it was just like uh, when he said, so what is your take on child support? I say, here's something that everyone should know. If you go to the court, Ask the referee to get out of the system. Mm -hmm. The referee then will allow you to get out of the system mm -hmm. if both parents are in cooperation. Exactly. And then you can, if there's contention, you can work together. Yes. Right? If there's a certain amount of maturity at the table. Yes. It is the, it is the trauma that plays a major role and us not being able to get along. It is the yes. history that we, how we see each other and what we've done, right? And, and I, I shared this earlier, uh, as men, that whole being a player dynamic, that whole process, it comes with a reaping component. So yeah, you might be the guy that's got all the girls, but you also get all the girl problems. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so at the same time, your kids may struggle to have that relationship. And yes. I, I don't know uh, about, you know, uh, one of our quotes that we use all the time in our work is mom, dad, you can make all the money in the world, but you just can't make up time. Exactly. exactly. They're only going to be one, one time, two, one time, three, one time. So you got to be impactful and tempful as parents in these kids' lives. And so I, I love that part about what's going on. So 
um, in your work with the parents and, 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 the, and the fathers, uh, besides them being at each other, what was the other telltale issue that kept them from being uh, in co-parenting? You know, so, some of it's just poor communication. Um, you know, just the, the basics of some relationships, uh, some, of it, some of it's just poor relationship so that, that, that so let's okay. This is how most relationships, not all, they start physical and there's an, the physical attraction and that's all good. And then once a baby comes, then there's a different relationship that has to be developed where people may not be ready for that relationship because it's still fresh and new. And that's not what they were trying to go into for, go into a relationship with is having a child. And so the, the things that really, the biggest issue I see is if child support, to be honest, if, if, a, if a mother needs a benefit, she should be able to get that benefit without the state getting involved. And the mother has a right to say, I don't want him to have a child support order because it's only going to make his life worse. And I've seen, I've been in so many courtrooms where the mother has said, I, it's going to make his life worse. He's a good guy. He's just having a hard time with his getting a job or maintaining the job. And I think that we need to give him a break. And I've heard judges say, well, I'm not doing that, even when they ask for it. So I think that's, some of it's just people not listening to the mother or people having relationship issues, or it's just people not understanding or people not having opportunities. I mean, I'm someone who will say, based on the opportunities that people have in this country, particularly black men, um, they're not, they're not, there's, there's, there's not as many. Now, people, people will say to me, well, he can do any kind of job, but because of people's personalities and how we decided, how we want to define manhood, working at McDonald's flipping burgers and being a dad to pay your child support, it's not enough. It's not, not enough to take care of a man, a kid, not enough to take care of the man. He, you can't live off of that. And so we need to figure out ways to, we need to really be honest. We're not providing enough service to black men, we're not enough. We're not providing enough service to men, but particularly the black and brown men, particularly black men. And the reality is that black men have some of the lowest, un, lowest, un, highest unemployment rates in this country. And it's not because they don't want to work; it's just because they're policed in a different way. They are, and once you get a record, your your job prospects get harder. Not always, but it does get to be harder when you have a job when you have any kind of police record. Um, and also in the child support system, they expect you to be able to pay on a regular basis. And many jobs, there's jobs where you don't have that opportunity. You just don't have the opportunity where you can do that. And many people get jobs where they pay in cash. And so then they can't pay the child support. Or people think for, one, I, one thing I hear all the time is, I'm out of work and I have a child support order. So they know I'm not working. So why are they still charging me child support? And people accumulate debt that way because the child support order is still clicking, even when you're not working or when you go to jail, that, that order is still clicking. And you need a lawyer or someone to go in and say, stop the order because I, I can't afford to pay it because I don't have any job. But also state policy will say in many states, well, just because he's not working, he voluntarily did something to put him in jail. So that's not my problem, that's his problem. And that hurts families when the, when the state's only interest is we've got to get money. Now, true that I do agree that yeah, the mother still has the child, she's still paying her bills, but it's only gonna hurt her and the child more if he gets so much debt where you constantly are putting him in, putting him in jail because he can't pay the debt. It's, it's like a vicious cycle that current that you know that hurts people, and I've seen people who have the same debt, and their kids are now forty. They're paying the child support order, so their dad, who is now sixty five, doesn't go to jail because he's paying the child support debt. It, it's the the system doesn't pay attention to some of these things that it's doing that's causing significant problems to children and to families. So yeah, but the the also they have to look even deeper. We had a father; um, he had. Uh, wasn't even his kid. Oh uh, yeah. Right. Um, uh, where it was just literally placed on him when he went to the yep. court. And yep. here it is, 18 years, have no no clue. 
right? And um, they were coming. And so we were able to go to the court, right? And learn and file the proper paperwork to knock off 80,000 of that arrearage. Oh, good. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so uh, it, on, on our behalf, the friend of the court is doing some things here to help, including they're doing monthly events, you know, from our fatherhood policy group, right? And so there are some things where they're trying to help us even on that side of things. But more importantly, if we can, uh, if we can impede that issue from not having the mistake. I know that sounds cliche, but if we can get out of that mode of the player and the womanizer, if we can get out of that mode and stop sharing that information and teach them how valuable they truly are, maybe we can pull at least 2 million out of 41 million out of the system you know, which is, that's on us, right? It, we're the examples and the, the people who have the information to share and really help men be better in this area. Um, I, I, my other question is in the child support area, um, besides the court and besides the, the parent, what other things can we do, right? What is that? that other thing that we can do to uh, navigate ourselves away from child support and work our way into the home. Hold on, doc, you, you went, you went, uh, check your- Okay, I'm sorry. I muted my, I'm sorry. Um, the one thing that I would say, uh, Calvin, which is, is so many men, unfortunately, are dependent on their mother or their girlfriend or their sister or their cousin, mm -hmm. because for those men who don't have the best resources, because it depends who we're talking about, for men who have limited resources, they have to depend on somebody because our government doesn't provide the same type of resources to men that they provide to women. And that's women with children. So for example, I always say the reason some of these men have children is not because they want to have the children, is because when they need a place to sleep, if the only place they can sleep because they don't have their own house is their girlfriend's house, when they may really want to be at their own crib or their own place, but they can't get it because of some either drug charge or no income or whatever it is, they can't really be independent. So they become dependent on somebody else. So until our social welfare system recognizes single adults that are possibly poor, or we provide a better job infrastructure, which President Biden is trying to do right now, so many men are gonna be dependent on other people to take care of them. Um, and not many, many men don't want that, but if, it, if, you, if this is a man who happens to be a man who is heterosexual and he's living and he's staying at his girl's place and they're in the same bed, it's a possibility they, they're, going, they're going to have some intimate relationship and there's a possibility they could have a child. So the, the whole idea of providing services where we collectively understand that men need to be independent but that means they need to be independent with some assistance. And that doesn't mean they're less than a man for assistance. I mean, I have had a lot of assistance in my life. People giving me advice, people giving me money, but it, it, I was always still independent. But some, I think all of us need, need some help, need a handout or a help just sometimes. And I think the one thing that we do a really bad job of is that we buy into this masculinity idea that I'm a man, I can do it by myself, but you sometimes you really can't. And I think it harms people in a way that we have, we've brought into something that for some people is just not reality until they're able to get on their own feet. And I think about my own son, for example, my son has done well, but when he has no problem asking me for assistance, he doesn't like to do it, but I have no judgment on him. And I want him to always know that as his parent, you can come to me with anything and I'll try my best. If I can help it, help you, I'm going to help you. But I'm not going to always say yes either. If, if it's unreasonable, like you want to have a new car, 
I'll say, man, you're going to get this used hoopty and it'll work. But, you know, whatever I can do to help my son is I want him to understand that I want you to carry that. If you have children, don't make your son or daughter feel that they can't come to you for assistance. And, I, and some people are different than me in that way, but I just feel that that's something that's not healthy. And it, it, it can cause some mental health issues. Um, and I know that wasn't the question, no. but, the, the, but, but, but the thing, the bottom line is that we need to have better social welfare policies because there's a group of men and women in our country that need assistance. And if, they're, and if they have children, they need assistance even more. That's why programs like yours and other fatherhood programs I know around the country that do a good job is they look at the total person. How can I help them with housing, help, food, clothing, a job, being able to see their children? You have to do the whole package. You can't just focus on one thing because people are, 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 are a total package. They're not just a father. They also are a man and they also have, they also have a job and they also need housing, they need food. So anyway, I think programs that deal with the total person is the way to go to avoid some of the issues that child support presents. Another thing about child support, I, before I forget that you had mentioned earlier, is that people go into the hospital and they sign this form called a paternity acknowledgement form. And I tell more and more men, do not sign that form. Because once they sign that form, they're saying they're the father of the child, whether they know it or not. And I'm not saying everyone needs to get a blood test and a DNA, but it just it just will be at every it just it's just to everyone's advantage to know if you're the father of the child because so many men I've seen in court, the judge says, "Well, have you talked to this child? Yes. Has this child called you daddy? Yes, but I'm not their father. Well, it's too bad that it's not good to the child now when they when they're only concerned about the money, but they're not concerned about the emotional well being of that child because it could cause a lot of problems between the child and that father who's not the father." around hating that child or not liking that child or being angry with that mother and child. So it's so complicated, but social services are what we need for men like we need it for women. Well, yeah, and we have to begin to value the seed because without me, there's no you. And if, yeah, we, exactly. if we don't begin to value the seed, um, the, the, as, as Dr. Miles Monroe put it, the incubator, mm -hmm. right? The incubation, right? But if we don't begin to value the seed, right? I, I'm, you know, the, the point you were making earlier, I kind of share a model where you're parenting before you even become a parent. Oh, so definitely. where you are in your walk of life, where mm -hmm. your education is, where that's all on your DNA code. Yes. Uh, right? Where your actions are, right? That's all on your DNA code. And, and, and it plays out in every, like each one of my kids, it's, it's amazing where i was at the time that they were conceived it's present uh, in their life it is yes. just amazing to watch and so you have to be there to navigate them past the potholes and and and, and the obstacles right and society has decided right you know to not see your value so what we decided to say was hold on uh dr david pate father david pate has 71 values he brings to the table right he, uh -huh. he, he, he's also, he shapes language. Uh, he, uh, when a father's in a kid's life from zero to nine, the child lives longer. Like he brings all these superhero pieces that this entire society was throwing away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have been throwing away. And so when we throw away the father, we're throwing our children into a system mm -hmm. that once you become dependent on, now you judge and select the system over the actual biological father mm -hmm. which yeah. is structure yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you know and how many children do you have by the way calvin i have five. Oh, wonderful i have only i only have two Four boys but... and a girl i have um I recently married and i have a stepson right but i have five okay very nice i would have had five but unfortunately three of my children died uh, before they were born and um people don't and that's another i mean i talk to men about that the whole issue of infant mortality and some of these so many of these men particularly young men i talked to most recently last year or two years ago there's they are so connected from the moment she's conceived the baby is conceived and they find out 
they want to know every single thing that's going on. And, you, they, and there's these apps now they can use. And they were telling me about these apps they look at. And one thing that I think was really bad that I, well, bad, but we changed it. Um, some of the men were going to the WIC office um, with the mother. And because they wanted to, they wanted to be there for the, to see what was going on. And when the doctor would ask questions about the child, the father would knew more information than the mother because he was the one that generally was more engaged and more involved, particularly early on. Fathers are very engaged with their children. They may not, sometimes it changes depending on just the schedule of their job and all of that. And the one thing we noticed was that they weren't recognizing father's roles where now that particular WIC center in the whole, in all of Wisconsin, you can engage fathers in WIC services because of the research I did and the data we collected. We saw that over a six month period, over a thousand fathers came into, came through the doors and they never even reckoned, they didn't even notice it until we collected data. I said, you know that men have been coming here and you, they, did, they didn't even recognize them as, they thought it was like they were invisible. They and were? I think they were. And I think the thing that, you know, you're doing in recognizing the role of men is that sometimes the men just say, you know what, forget it. They don't even recognize me anyway, so why should I be involved? And that's sometimes the, the position people take. And some of us are able to get over that and keep staying involved. But I know many a day I would be involved with my kids and they would say, oh, you're a good, um, you're being a mom, dad, or you're the, you're doing oh, something. We, we can't like, have nothing. It, it's, we got to always put something else on who we are. I, exactly. That, I, that part, I, I'm not taking. This is yeah, my I, holiday. This is our holiday. I yeah. don't want to hear nothing about, yeah, I'm, you know, and, and, you know, I had this conversation and I seen this video where this guy was talking, right? And I, I ended up getting a conversation with him and he was like, um, me getting a pat on the back because me being a dad, you know, was like, you know, I don't need that, you know, like, so I said, because yeah. oh, I'm doing my job. That goes back to that masculinity piece. And I said, yeah. really? He said, yeah. I say, so when Mother's Day roll around, is that the same philosophy? She shouldn't yeah. she act the way you act? It's Mother's Day. Should she not say, "Oh, I don't need nothing. I'm just doing my job." No, she's yeah, it's, it, it, and, and I hate that, man, yeah. man. And so, you know, of course, I never thought about that. That's the invisible. Whenever you see a father, whenever we recognize a man in his children's life. I never thought that then becomes an apply to this man. It's incredible. Um, there was a book um, Stephen Baskerville did where they studied, right? Mm -hmm. They sat outside of schools and everything, watching the interaction with fathers and the children, right? Mm -hmm. Children, when the mothers took the kids to school, the mothers ultimately always walked the kids in the school. Mm -hmm. fathers would pull up the kids would get out like clockwork walk in and you never had to be concerned mm -hmm. about the kid the kid walked in walked into the class the whole nine but the kids mm -hmm. that was being walked in by the mother the mother couldn't leave they were emotional they were actually giving the mother what they are accustomed to mm -hmm. right whereas the father prepares them sends them in have a great day hug them they turn the corner and they go. I know I, going inside the school when my kids were little, uh, that was, hey, I'm dropping you off, I'm gone, right? Yeah. Once they were able to get out that car and go in, all right, yeah. have a great day. You <laughs> Me know too. I mean? <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. Have a great day, right? Because that teaches that independence. Yes, yes. Right? That, that, that freedom to be able to walk in and, and, and take in your surroundings. When you hold their hand, they don't have to look at that. Exactly. Right? They become they're right here so you yeah. say well, why my son doesn't want to go uh or want to be right in the meanwhile the the daughter she gets all these nutrients mm -hmm. because of the in-house role model and she takes off and flies right so at the end of our ceremony i want to share this with you and then we'll move on uh casey already sent me a message he's not coming on so um we'll end when you're ready to end probably in a few minutes but i i really at the end of our program, Dr. Tate, right? Our ceremony for our mentoring program, uh, we have a 98% parental involvement. And, oh, nice. Yep, and our parents participate. Mm -hmm. Our boys 
have to go through this regimen, like, um, you know, a rite of passage program. At the end, mm-hmm. they get a jacket that says, I'm an ME future leader. Okay. Right? And so they go through 14 weeks of this training, right? And at the end, each kid has to come up and present and do oh, their nice. thing, right? And so I was having a conversation with the parents. I said, isn't it amazing that we give our daughters the book, but we give our sons the game? Mm-hmm. How big of a dynamic and separation is that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How is it that we don't give the boy the book? We're mm-hmm. already placing him behind. Yes. In yes, my, yes. just for my work. Yes. Right? yes just in. Because what happens is the boy, right? Everyone holds his hand. So now yes. he can't, he can't leave. Yeah, right? exactly. He can't make a mistake and get up. So we got boys five to 11 commit suicide, right? Mm-hmm. Why? Because he, look at where he's left at. Look at what he's left with, right? And then his thoughts and then the video game violence and all these other phenomena that come with our children indoctrinated in these games and stuff, right? So of course you can be a gamer and you can make money and all of that. You can design games because it's tech age. I get all of that. But what I don't understand is not at the development stage. The development stage, they say that as men, um, I don't know if you read the article, but men, um, our boys have less testosterone than us as grown men. Well, I haven't read that. Yeah, so our boys are losing testosterone at a very alarming rate. Wow. Very alarming rate, right? And so mm-hmm. when you when you see that dynamic, um, what is it? Well, books allow you to fly. You and I mm-hmm. both, I mean, behind you is a, a hundred books just in visual, mm-hmm. right? Books allow you to fly. Where are you flying to with that game, right? So I just wanted to touch on that, man. And and so um, I really appreciate you. I know you, you um, came on, but if you can, give us three solutions. You know, I think one of them is, is, a personal solution and I think that we have to start to I know for me as an example I started teaching my son in particular that you have responsibilities in the house and your responsibility to yourself and I think that you start out by teaching and but also with that responsibility comes um it's, it's responsibility I mean I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there because and one thing, and one thing you were saying earlier was, I remember, I, I remember my son and daughter would, when they turned ten, their job was to do their laundry. I, we, my, my, my wife or I did not do their laundry anymore for the rest of their, unless we wanted to. But if their clothes were dirty, if they didn't do them, and they had to go to school with the clothes they had, that was on them. They had to wear dirty clothes, and they learned, and they to this day, they 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 know how to do their laundry. And they did their laundry. They made some mistakes. They bleached their clothes, but that's the way they learn. And so I think it's important to kind of, it's important to instill in your kids a sense of responsibility early on for your boys and your girls. I think it's also important to instill in terms of solution, making sure kids know who they are, particularly black kids, know historically what they've, what they've contributed, people who came before them. Um, this country would not be America if there was no black people who were enslaved, America, black people built this country, the democracy, the everything we, what this country has built is all the wealth in this country came from enslaved people. So for black fathers and for black children, I think it's important to know who they are. So it's responsibility, knowing your history. And thirdly, being sure that you understand how policies affect the mother. If you're, if you're, try, if you're a poor father, if you're not a poor father, just really trying to figure out how you can work together if you're not going to be in the same household because it's all about the children and really keep that anger and all that other stuff yeah. out of the house, away from the child because it really, it does affect the child later on um, in ways that you may not even think. And, and, and babies are very absorbent. They start hearing that stuff early on. So all that kind of yin and yang arguing is not good. It's important to really think about how do I even maintain my maturity um, for the benefit of my child? Because that's the bottom line here. You want your children 
to do something beyond you, um, to be representative of you. So responsibility, um, his history, and being mature about your relationship is really important to me. I, I got to add before you slide out, I tell every father that calls me, that comes to me, I think it's important that he checks the DNA of his child. Yeah, oh, definitely. Right, when when the study came out a couple of years ago that over the counter 40 some percent of the DNA test kits came back that the actual father wasn't the father, that's alarming. And, and so yes. I, yeah. I tell many, many men don't, it's not personal. Uh, we, we have a brother uh, that comes on out of Georgia. Man, I, I hate, I can't think of his name, but that's what he talks about, right? He'll be a guest on right now, I'm lost for words, but he does a great job, right? In his story and his work, he took on the Atlanta Supreme Court and about DNA testing and mm -hmm. discovering. One of the agencies we worked with with diagnostic testing, the actual owner, he went through the same process in discovering that his kids were not his kids. And he he was it was, he was in Michigan and the kids were his mm -hmm. grandmother. And the grandmother said these kids are not yours. And, mm -hmm. and, and she said yeah. they're starting to look like the boy down the street here. Well, I yeah. can't go in even further that story. And then my own brother. Yeah. Experienced it. And then I know a lot of men. I, one of my dads, you know, you got a bunch of kids with two of the kids aren't here. You know, and, you know, not doing that DNA testing is, it, you know, it's a disservice because you need to know that this is, you're in the house with your kid. And I, I find that to be uh, the other thing. And, and, and last, I, again, I truly appreciate your time. And um, if you can tell the people uh, where they can follow you, and, uh, and and before you do that, what's this next research project? Uh, my next big research project is I'm um, going to be following uh, about 40 men who are coming home from prison. And I want to see what, what their life is like when you return back from prison. Um, I'm very interested in seeing what policies are in place that don't allow people, particularly men who have been incarcerated, their ability to, to gain citizenship rights again, like, like housing and food and education, um, voting, how has the child support system affected them? So I'm trying to tell a story that's not about the men, but more so about how the system makes it harder for people to even to come back and be reacclimated to society. So that's my next big, big project. And then also I'm gonna be doing some work with possibly with city of Philadelphia around fatherhood work and males and providing services um in in city of philadelphia as well so those are the two things that are going to keep me busy for at least the next three or four years well if you ever need some help okay yeah you know i don't hesitate to call calvin man and i will definitely do that we're, we're headed to we're looking inside of 10 cities right now ourselves uh, okay and moving uh and seeing how we can get more men um to the table and raise the value continue to raise the value of fatherhood. Um, and it's, it's, I think that's ultimately important from your work. And if you can share with where they can follow you and see, and you know, because I'm, we're gonna stay in touch and, and, and most definitely um, I appreciate your time because I know this was very important to me, right? To get this information because a lot of people don't get quality information. So I thank you for that, but share where we can follow you at. They, they, they can follow me on Twitter. Um, my handle is David A. Pate. That's, that's the at sign David J. Pate. Um, or they can, uh, yeah, which is that's, that's the main way you can follow me is on Twitter. But also you can follow, you know, your, people are welcome to email me at pateD at uwm.edu. So you can email me if you have questions or thoughts, um, or you can follow me on Twitter, um, which is the one place I'm on. on a lot, uh, pretty actively. So that's, those okay. are the two ways to best reach me. So, so, so Doc, I, I do want to uh, throw this in here. When I am done, right, um, I would love for you to uh, forward my parenting from brokenness. I would love to hear what your thoughts are when you get, when you get this book in your hand. Um, my manuscript will be done sometime this year. Oh, and, good. I would right, love to hear. And, and we're, we're, 
we're putting together some some pieces and if there's some you want to contribute or ideas that you think that we should move then that'll be perfect because i want to make sure that we paint a healthy picture yes and here are some steps that we can do you know a couple of years ago i did this thing about 10 steps that parents can uh-huh. do be better uh, and that came from just you know you know 30 years of work but again thank you dr david pate i know uh i appreciate i know you got things to do and i truly appreciate you coming on and sharing this time with me um your gift will arrive sometime <laughs> or tomorrow um, well thank you so and, much and i would love a picture that would okay. make my year okay and, uh, and uh i appreciate you man and and, and god bless you and your family and uh, thank you for great work yeah, and also if I can be, if you would like to invite me back at another time, I'm happy. If you have another topic we can talk about, please feel free to invite me back. Yeah, I, I, I'll most definitely reach out. I, I want to do something face to face soon, maybe even okay. early next year. I, I will okay. most definitely reach out. Definitely. And I, I look forward to coming to Detroit. Yes, sir. Okay. Take right. care. Yes, Thank you. you. Yep. Take care. Thank be you. safe. Bye bye. Bye bye.